not till the session that follows this session. Uh, all right, so last set of questions before we move into designing the office of the future. Uh, this one revolves around the role of literary manager to dramaturg to rehearsal room and how that's working, uh, what that, uh, what's the baby in there, what's the, the challenge, uh, who wants to start us off? Everybody's afraid to begin. Here. I'll start this off. Um, I find that a dramaturg is an incredible resource to a playwright. Um, what I find is that sometimes the dramaturg doesn't get activated early enough in the relationship. Uh, there's a lot of demands that are being done to the dramaturg at that time. And in many ways, the dramaturg isn't always part of the artistic talks and the talks with the artistic director, etc. And I would just think that, um, I mean, I would. I would like that, I think also as playwrights, we could help activate that relationship earlier by making demands that we be part, or that drop, that person be part of the discussion from scenic design earlier on. I think, I think the whole new play process, discussions need to start much earlier than they do. We're not even talking about getting into The relationship has to begin much earlier. The playwright, dramaturg, literary Literary manager, as well. yes. Talk about that. But you're talking about the rehearsal room. Uh, I, I would argue that if the dramaturg has done her or his job, you should be 90 to 95 percent done by the time you start rehearsal, because that's the director's time, and uh, your function changes at that point. I think that to whatever extent, and this is much more true regionally. Then again, my new environment in New York, where essentially a director is hired early on, and the director historically in New York is the person who functions dramaturgically. So there's less of that that happens in there. But from the old West Coast days, I think the point, John, right, is we, we try to be pretty much done with any kind of structural work we're doing with the playwright by the time rehearsals start, because plays don't get fixed in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. What, what, uh, uh, go ahead, you. Oh, yeah, I, 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 even though I've almost agreed with most things Jerry said, I'm not sure I agree with that. And especially, and, and the reason I, I want to say that is because I think, I, I've been trying to parse out, you know, the, the disconnect between what I feel I hear about working as a literary manager, dramaturg, and what I've been hearing this weekend. There's been this kind of huge disconnect. So we were in the last breakout and we were talking about, um, Christian came up with it and it was the thing that I think is relevant in this case, which is um, uh, that, that one of the reasons that the, the person who often knows the most about the play, so in this instance, you know, I, I think the part that's, you know, the, the way the dramaturg is integral is they usually, uh, you know, in many cases have the initial relationship with the writer. Oftentimes, they know the writer's work from the very first play they wrote, you know, or the, you know, I mean, and so they've been following it along. They actually know how the play sounds on the page when they read it because they know the voice of the writer. So they actually are bringing something that's integral to the process. And we were, in the breakout I was in, we were talking about the, the, somehow that integral role is not acknowledged as integral. So what happens in the trajectory from, you know, I'm in the literary office, I'm reading plays, whew, here I found this play, it's a writer I've been following for a long time, and you know, I want to get it. To, so some, a miracle happens, and that play goes to production. And, you know, it's the play you've been championing and the writer you've been championing. And then somewhere along the line, the dramaturg no longer is integral. And, and actually, one of the places I think that is, Jared, in my experience, is you get to production, and actually, when you're sitting in the room, you, you have, I think, you have a pretty good, clear sense of what that play's saying, how that play behaves. And I actually think, for a long time, you know it better than the director. And, 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 and I mean, you know, or you have a version of it, and maybe the director's gonna do something different, but that the, it seems to me that's when the dramaturg voice is actually quite integral. And, and so now I've been in enough rehearsal processes now where the director comes in, you know, the relationship has, I don't know, whatever been, you know, a relationship I've been fostering, the conversation I've been having, and then, uh, you know, I become completely invisible in that rehearsal room process and conversations are happening that I think 
would be incredibly useful for the director to be a part of. Now, if I'm working with a director who knows me and knows how to work with me, and I know how to work with them, and we all work together, that's great. But if it's the um, fake matches that we make, where we throw a director of uh, that regional thing we do, where we make a mat, we throw a director in the room. So I, I just had an experience, um, you know, this year at Arena where, uh, you know, like the, the, all of a sudden the director wants the player to start rewriting the play, for example, and, the, you know, and I'm like, whoa, I don't think the play, you know, I did do the 95% of the work, I actually think the play needs rewriting, you know. In Carly, the, just, yeah. just let me ask, to, to, at what point did you meet this director prior to beginning rehearsal? No, I wasn't invited into the meeting of the director prior to beginning rehearsal. Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm, what I'm you saying is... You see what I'm saying about the lack of I'm a, Yeah, but I'm agreeing with Karen, in other words, if, if all that has happened ahead of time, yeah. I'm saying if, if you're trying to build a relationship in rehearsal, it, mm -hmm. it's too late. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah. You need yeah, to walk yeah, in the room with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So. But I'm saying, I'm saying in the institutions, oftentimes the, the, the dramaturg is not seen as integral. Oh, yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Sure. To have gotten there, yeah. right? That's all. I, that, that's what I was trying. They're not, they're integral here, then they're ignored, ignored, and then they get thrown in the room. Well, I think that there's a couple of things are on my mind, and I'm sorry. Can you say Yes, yeah. I was actually Thanks. just about to apologize oh, for the possibility that I might not make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to let people know, I did encourage some people on the circle to let us know if you can't hear us, because we had that trouble at the last table. So, so if we get that, it's because I've asked for that. So go. I, I, I have also had the experience of being, you know, just sort of randomly assigned and having it be tragically awful either for me or, and if it's just tragically awful for me, I don't really care that much because if it doesn't hurt the play, then that's fine. And if I can still have the, the smug superiority complex, the play would have been better if everyone would have listened to me, then that's okay as long as the play is okay and as long as the writer's okay. It doesn't really matter to me necessarily so much at this point in my career what my place is at the table, as long as I feel like my place is at the table is what everyone needs my place at the table to be. But I also, I, I find actually that it is becoming rarer, and I don't know if that's because I'm at a different institution now, or, or, and I think things were even changing at the previous institutions at which I worked, because the development process has changed, for better or for worse. But I was actually, at, in the organizations I've worked the, on new work, and at OSF this is true too, the playwrights have the decision of who their director is. And so if I have a relationship with that playwright from the day that they emailed me their script, then I'm already going to have a relationship with that director because I have the relationship with the playwright and the playwright has the direct relationship with the director and then I'm gonna come in and it's it's either gonna be a productive triangle or somebody has to leave and that might be me. I think one of the things that we don't always teach young dramaturgs is that sometimes you don't have to be there, that sometimes you're not actually necessary or sometimes you're necessary to the playwright in a different way outside the room than you are in the room. I, I want to come into a different place to um, here. This is maybe a little provocative, I don't know. But I was struck in the manifestos, all the, the great uh, ideas that uh, came out and the, and the kind of big vision of what the literary office could be and what you know, what its role, uh, what the baby might be in the future. But when asked what it was that made everybody know that they were, they made the right choice, uh, like an example of when you knew you made the right choice for this, every person except for Amritha talked about a time <coughs> when they were talking to a playwright about, uh, like a dramaturgical relationship with a playwright in a new play developing the text. And there was, it wasn't actually in the manifestos but it was what made people feel like they were in the right role. And is, what's, what's up? Is, is the rehearsal room the, the goal of the, of the person in the job? Is that, is that like, the, is the rest of it, it's out, made it sound to me like the rest of it is grunt work. I, I, I can speak to that a little bit because I'm not currently working as a dramaturg in the theater. I, yeah. I'm, working as kind of a coach, professor, dramaturg in, in a relationship with nine to 12 playwrights in a graduate playwriting program all the time. So I'm constantly having those conversations. And um, I actually hunted down and sought out this job so that I could do that as an end in itself. Now whether that's 
fruitful or useful to the American theater or to the institution or to uh, the literary office. I don't know. But that particular kind of relationship is exactly why I do what I do. I mean, it's, it's hard, it's, you know. It's Which relationship is that? My, my relationship to a playwright uh -huh. and, to, right. and to working through a play with a playwright. That, that, kind, of, that kind of moment is, is exactly why I do what I do. Okay, I'll wait. Back to you. Again, if I haven't made this, the dramaturg is the person that has the opportunity to work with the writer before the rehearsal starts mm -hmm. in most institutions. And if you, don't, if you don't take advantage of that opportunity to build a relationship, to share an understanding of the play, to work with the director as the director comes on board, yeah. and then you've got a room full of actors, and they've all got contributions to make too. So the point is that you know, there's, there's only so much time to get done what you can do, and, and you're the person that has the chance to do it before all of that happens. And if you're trying to share the room with 15 people as opposed to one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to be at a disadvantage. And it's work you should have done previously that you're trying to play catch-up on if you haven't done it. And in the world of, as it's currently organized, that time the previously, all that time Previously, I don't think it's I don't think it's built into the institution. Yeah, yeah. 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 right. Yeah. And and what people are actually doing, those of you who are doing that stuff, are overwhelmed by this other part of the work that we've been talking about, like the 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 reading, the season planning, the um, conversation, the list that Aaron just read is what's taking people's time during the time when you would be. I, I have to. I, I think I find the opposite for myself. I find myself. I, I simply cannot be a rehearsal room dramaturg who sits in the rehearsal room every day. Um, I can sit in the rehearsal room for maybe a couple of days or, you know, come for runs. Um, but because of, as, as a literary manager dramaturg in a one-person literary office, I can't not do literary management for six weeks or for four weeks or however long the rehearsal mm -hmm. process is. So um, that's the time that I can't spend. But I can do coffee shop dramaturgy, yeah. um, which is the before the play starts. Or I can do, you know, Skype dramaturgy or email dramaturgy. Um, and I find that for myself to be in the rehearsal room, I'm in the rehearsal room at times because it's the playwright who has advocated for me to come in, mm -hmm. who has said, "This is the scene, Danielle. That well, is. <laughs> they're rehearsing the scene. I don't agree with what's going on, or you know, this actor isn't." Is this actor communicating this or so? You know, it's the playwright who advocates for me to come at crucial moments. Um, and I don't know if that's fair for the playwright to have to do that, but that's sort of how it works. Yeah, and I think, and that's, that's a, exactly, and I think every institution is different. My job now, you know, I'm, I'm there from before the person has the idea, you know, and I'm there when they send the first draft. and. I'm not necessarily, I'm actually going to be a production dramaturg this year, and then I'm going to be a production dramaturg again next year for two shows that, I wasn't there right when the ideas happened, but I've been there to help them develop it, and I have that relationship with those people already, so that work is, is kind of done, and hopefully, you know, my job now, I have a different kind of time than I had in my previous job that when I'm actually going to be dramaturging that show, with the exception of figuring out how the heck to get to my nephew's bar mitzvah, I will be in, that will be my job while I'm there with no other particular jobs to worry about, um, which was not true previously, where I would be dramaturging two or three projects at a time in the season or the festival with all the other administrative responsibilities and, and that. And that I found very sort of not actually as troubling as I thought I would because it sort of made me have to reevaluate how essential I actually am and when I am most essential and what my relationship is with people to the whole process and not just a 10 to 6 rehearsal schedule or you know to make sure that I could check in with people if I couldn't be there during the day. I think that's a different problem than just being assigned to people, which has also happened. You know, just you know, when there's that play that you know, when the dramaturg split up their assignments and you get that show that you don't understand, or the director is someone that you just don't have a. I don't get along with everybody, and that's okay. <laughs> it's like, 
and you get assigned to that director who doesn't get you, or that playwright who doesn't get you, of just knowing to leave is a different problem than time. Um, I, it's funny, I was thinking I've worked with uh, three of you at this table <laughs> in, in a, as dramaturgs, and my um, experience has generally been that the dramaturg for me has been uh, in, it, kind of a lifeline and a saving grace of a lot of productions. And it's not, I'm, I'm curious about why we're talking so much about the text of a play as being much bigger than what it really is in, in the success of a theatrical production. You know, when we know that the success of a production is dependent on the right inflection of so many meanings and so many intelligences working together and how rough that road is. And for me, one of the most vital experiences I've had with drama, dramaturgs and John, also I've worked with here, has been um, with them as witnesses in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, Polly and I certainly experienced that in my last production here. Uh, because a writer alone in, the, in a rehearsal room is kind of like a damned soul, right? You just sit there and you go, I'm, I'm the... And the kind of still photo on the wall where the event is taking place. And you need perspective and you need help. And you need help sorting out what's your your thoughts, fears, and feelings with what's really there. If there's if there's trouble, somebody who is not a playwright needs to, to know how that trouble is coming and and help pull people back to where they need to be. So to me it's a it's a it's a very high uh, a very high importance that there is a person of that kind of theatrical intelligence that thinks all around it. And I just wonder if in America we don't give proper respect to what that mm. is. Mm. I feel like we don't in this country understand how key that is to good art making. Well, and it you know? seems like a, an early, build, actually the, the thing that is missing from the early part is the relationship time maybe between director and dramaturg. Because mm -hmm. I think Perhaps. often the playwright and director are going to have some sort of existing relationship at, at this point is, is my sense. But, but not necessarily the connected dots. And actually, I mean, um, uh, uh, I, I don't mean assistant director in the sense that we often think about assistant directors of note takers, but actually that's how I've often related to a dramaturg, is understanding like, is the set functioning properly in the way that it needs to for this play to function? And that's that. I've that's seen directors like, getting more information from the 18 year old that's mm -hmm. getting their coffee than they do from the dramaturg of the theater. I see that a lot. It's like whoever's closest and to their body most of the time is where they're getting like crucial artistic feedback from. Because mm. directors need it too. So I, I wish that could become healthier mm. in theater production. Is it um, important in this um, story that we're talking about? What's the importance of it being an in, a representative of the institution as the dramaturg? Or, uh, it, I mean, there are certainly uh, accomplished freelance dramaturgs in this room. Uh, it can though it is what you're talking about, Amy. Uh, certainly, I don't know about the circumstance in this particular uh, case whether that could have been uh, true. But can, for the most part, can that witness be the playwright's witness, or does it need to be an institutional witness? I've had that be very important. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I've had yeah, that the, be very, very important because I've um, worked on some collaborative processes within institutions and. In those moments, it was actually the, the dramaturg was the, I think, the person who was able to translate what we were doing to the institution and to translate to us what the institution needed from us. And also because the way that those plays are made are through a series of rehearsal rooms that then, over the course of like a year or two years, that then culminate in rehearsal for the production, that um, having the dramaturg uh, be, because when doing DIY theater, I didn't always have the dramaturg, and then having someone be with us through that process is um, was, was amazing and then and, and to have that person be be able and also um, because I uh, collaborate with so many different kinds of artists so much to be able to tend to me and make sure that I was tending to the text and to which is not something that I'm especially um, always tuned to, uh, to to make sure that I took responsibility for that was a real gift to me that I got from some dramaturgs that I worked with and in institutions and then to be able to explain to them even though the script was not readable <laughs> that what it, what it was, and because they had authority within their institution, was, um, was really an extraordinary thing. To, and it was the only way that that work was able to happen. But it gets very fragmented, I think, and I know that's a really great instance of it, but I think there's so many demands being done on the dramaturgs that it gets very fragmented in many ways. And I also wonder if that isn't a source of, of tension in a way, to, to your point about 
who uh, who is the dramaturg serving? You know, in my yeah. case too, I feel that um, you know it's always been to serve the play, as I understand it, through the art, the writer or the creative artist, and so that's that's if in the, invited into the room, that's the that's what I'm performing is the service to that play, as I understand it, through the playwright, and I think to your point about the witnessing a process and being able to respond outside of the room to the artist when they come and say, what did you see, you know, and, and be able to respond to, um, to, to those questions in addition to interpreting something in the room. So it's both about the process and the play itself. And I feel dramaturgically at the, um, to, to Eric's point about, um, I feel that the work at, that we do at New Dramatist was in seeking out that was, was about wanting that dynamic dialogue with artists and how that translates into a dynamic process and to be able to find um, a way to create processes based on a project at any stage of development was, um, was a dream in a way that was not happening within an institution in which I served as a dramaturg. It was a sort of one size fits all and that became so evident that that was not, um, that was not adequate. That was not an adequate system in which new plays or any kind of process was able to transpire. So, but I think it's about serving the, the play. Mm -hmm. There was something earlier that someone uh, said, and uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I don't remember where it came from, but something about the difference between the dramaturg uh, as focused on the play, the literary manager focused on the the institution, uh, uh, and I, I don't, I don't know how you respond to that. I mean, if, I'm trying to get to. I, I'm going for this one small thing, and I, I realize I'm like, oh, uh, I keep pulling you back into it. But this whole thing about coming out of this weekend with some sense of what it is that we want to move into, um, and and does that what we want to move into include this uh, notion? That there's a that the institutional dramaturg is the um, the primary model for how to uh, how to work with new plays. I wonder what happens, for example, in that when then your play is developed in seven different places, and you've got now you're carrying all of these different relationships and opinions. What happens? How it, as opposed to you can go to seven institutions with the same writer and dramaturg, and a different, it seems to me that's a different process. And that's something I wish we, we had talked more about, is, I mean, I, I, there was there's one play in particular I remember at a Humana Festival where I spent the entire pre-rehearsal with that writer taking out other people's notes, <laughs> because he had been to six or seven different development centers and had talked to any number of artistic directors, and and had tried so hard to fit everything in that we sort of, instead of putting new notes in, we were taking old notes out. And I don't think that that happens as much anymore, and I think writers themselves are getting better at choosing which notes to actually take. One of the things I'm very proud of that we're doing at OSF is that both for the season with you know the 500-year-old Shakespeare plays as well as with the commissions is making sure that the writer also has the dramaturg that they want. So Robert Schenken is coming in with Tom Bryant. He's, you know, I am helping him, and Louis is helping him, and any number of people are helping him, and also help Tom, so that Tom can also show you, you know, where where the bodies are buried, where the marketing department is, where the toner is, where the bathroom is, whatever it is that the institutional dramaturg does as host. Um, so you can but, separate the function of host and sort of uh, <laughs> process navigator uh, to a staff position and leave the artistic collaboration yeah, which I am greatly enjoying. Was not. I mean, I did shows at the Humana Festival where people came in with their own dramaturg too. Or at least I did one project where someone came in with their own dramaturg. But it, it gets trickier, I think, when you have. And, and I don't know how to solve it, and I don't even know that it's necessarily a problem for other people. If it was just something that bugged me, was that you know that you know if if somebody wants to work with somebody other than me as a dramaturg, I don't necessarily think they should be stuck with me as their dramaturg, as awesome as I am. Mm -hmm just because I'm the one who gets the check from the theater. One of the things that we were talking about in our past breakout and just seems to be coming up over and over is can the dramaturg 
or institutional dramaturg or literary manager advocate for the institution to remain nimble enough, which is Rachel's word, um, to uh, sort of be flexible and allow a project to have what it needs, even if it's not the institution's traditional structure for staff and how, how that's possible. Does yeah. seem, oh, oh, no, please. No, just um, this goes uh, with what you were saying and uh, back to Deborah, how you were talking about it, but um, it seems like it, it is dependent on how, um, I don't want to say respected, but uh, uh, how much authority that, that person has within the institution to both advocate. And, like, if the institution chose that project, then presumably the institution has interest in that project, which, and if the dramaturg was a part of that choice, then they are empowered to help advocate for what that play needs once it's within the institution's sort of boundaries. And so it can almost sort of flip places because it's solid in both places. I think it's, yeah. But then I wonder, going back to the tension, is that because I feel like it's, because, yes, because in some places it feels like that that's, um, I, I guess it's, does the institution think of the dramaturg as an artistic collaborator, right. or is it just the bringer of the play, and then the art, the artist will take it from there. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel, yeah, yeah, yeah that's part of that tension. Yeah, yeah it's like it's stringing around something that's being said here, which is sort of like, it's this weird, again, it's this kind of weird way that the dramaturg slash literary manager is caught in between this sort of like, you know, creative contributor to the process, the institutional representative of something, and then the person who's also, if you're in the literary, if you're not just the resident dramaturg who's been assigned to the project, which is pretty, I, you know, you see that quite a bit less, I think. Usually you see somebody wearing several hats who's actually also doing um, the audience engagement piece with, you know, uh, with the marketing department, for example. So the other creative, other creative artists on the project, when the project comes in, they all go into the room, close the door, and work on the project. And the, the institutional person does, you know, they go in and out, and sometimes it makes sense for them to go in and out. It's not that. It's more the sense of what the, how they're perceived. And then what happens, and I know this happened to me all the time, especially, you know, at Steppenwolf was, and at the Playwright Center, too, I had to run out and do this other stuff, you know? Like, it was never right. that I was, and, and, and I didn't, uh, I, I, we didn't, we never created, a, there isn't a conversation happening that says, okay, you know, when I go into the room, I'm going in, you know, like, I mean, I've worked at enough theaters now, when the artistic director goes into rehearsal, you don't see them, you know, very much when they're directing the play, because they've gone in into the room and shut the door, and there's this weird way, and I think, my suspicion about that navigation is it's the thing that makes the dramaturg at risk of being less integral. <laughs> Do you know, I mean, that sort of sense of you could go there, or you could go here, or you might have just been, I mean, it's very common that the institutional dramaturg gets jobbed onto the project that they have no, no history with because it came to the theater, you know? So it, it feels to me like that's what is one of the, the things that everyone's trying to balance. Well, if we're in a world where there's, we're pulled in too many directions as, as a group of people all trying to do the right thing, <laughs> uh, and what we, what, uh, and I, this could not be the world, but it felt like listening to the, the manifestos and then the what, where's your heart, that the heart for most of the people in this room who are in the literary manager dramaturgy world is actually in the relationship, in the room, close the door. That's where everybody's trying to go. Before the room, yeah. Before the room. Well, okay, but it's before, but but that but it's but it's what would lead you to be in the room when the door is closed, doing all the work that would that like the focus would be the work up to the point when the when the door closes, you're closed on the inside of it, and then you get to stay there. Well, what you have access to the door. You have, you have the key to the door. <laughs> but if that's what's if that's the holy grail, if that's what's right, that's what we're doing, then. What about all this other work? Like, what? Who does it? Who does it as a first priority? Who does it as a as creatively and as engaged as? I think a lot of us are omnivorous. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, at least for myself, I, I I couldn't do one thing all the time. And so, even if like if I look for like the emotional high point, and the emotional high point was in that conversation, that doesn't mean that I think as a dramaturg, I think one of the things that makes dramaturgy so attractive is the constant newness and the multiple projects that we're juggling. So there is something, I think, in the, like, that it's not just grunt work. 
to do the other stuff, but you do need that stuff. You know what I mean? I think it's about having a balance, and I wouldn't want to just do one thing for myself. Yeah, the, the, it's also a priority here. Uh, this is a new play we're producing. Mm -hmm. So am I going to go read six plays off a stack and ignore the one we're doing? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I mean, you have to set your priorities mm -hmm. uh, and, and get the work done on time, which, again, I would advocate is, is take the time that's given to you early. And maybe I'm, you know, we, we have a particularly lucky thing in that we have respect, we have place, it's a, it's a part of our process, John, or, you know, in, in terms of what we had at South Coast. If that's not the normal practice, then, then it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody should work towards that because it's to the benefit of any theater to work that way. And I haven't, I mean, it's been a very long time since I felt like I have been specifically excluded. Yeah, it's been a very long time since I've felt like I was specifically excluded from a room as much as I haven't figured out how to be useful. And some of that's on me as much as everybody else. But I'm not sure I, I, I'm not sure that I need to be in the rehearsal room all the time. Yes, I want to be there when a playwright needs me there, and I want to know that I am engaged in that process. But I don't need to sit through a choreography rehearsal and yeah. watch the paint dry while they figure out like who's moving the candlestick from stage right to stage left. You know, it's like I'll come in when they move the candlestick from stage right to stage left and say, I don't know why you're moving the candlestick from stage right to stage left, and that, and that will actually be fine as long as it's fine with the artist I'm working with, whether it be on a new play with a writer or whether it be on a classic with a director. But it's it's a it's a mushy it's a more mushy thing than I'm being excluded or I'm not being excluded for me. I wonder if it's also just about an on, the ongoing conversation and wanting to be a part of the ongoing conversation from which then you know things like press releases or development copy or the other aspects that you're sometimes engaged in as a dramaturg is part of the conversation that is started with the artist that mm -hmm. you're a part of, that the, can, that the, uh, the artistic team <coughs> is part of rather than you bring the plays and then you're, thank you for your contributions, now go and do these other, all these administrative things that we need done as the institution. Because my feeling is that, that the admin is sweeter. It's like it, it's when you know what the conversation is and with whom, and that goes out of the conversations that you have with the artists, with the project, with the artistic team, and then that informs and inspires things that are, you know, like a press release. I mean, there's a way to be creative in a press release or to write development copy or to work with the development director because you are the, uh, a liaison with the artists and the project then that becomes more, um, it's you know, sweeter and more creative and more dynamic. So um, rather than just this sort of, I don't know that I would want to be in the room and close the door even, you know, I love process and I love the mess of that, but, and that informs everything else that one might have to do that is more um, monitor centered or, you know. I, I guess it's about effectiveness too, like what's, what, how do we get the balance right so that, that things are, whether, whether it's my favorite part of the job or not my favorite part of the job, like what needs to be done and how does it get done? Um, and you're talking about priorities when we're producing a play and a new play, somebody's got to go there. And at the same time, somebody's doing the press release, the, the, you know, the content, the program note, all of that as, uh, at the same time is um, developing. I, I, I wonder how we, I, I don't see how it's possible to do all of those things. I guess I'm, I'm saying I, I, I'm not sure how this office works when these are, when it goes in all those directions simultaneously and there's a yes. chorus of one. That's right. right. Yeah. And especially when that chorus of one is hoping that they spend the majority of the time in the relationship with the playwright about the production, even not just the text, but a lot of it's I, just, I feel like that's a problem. I think it's kind of both the joy and the curse of the sprawl of literary office. I mean, you have, I mean, as you're saying, you have the wonderful fact that you, being in the, in the rehearsal room, it touches all the work that you're doing. And as much as you may love, you know, that conversation that you're having with the playwright, um, I think dramaturgy in itself is such a, a field, I mean, the field itself kind of refuses to be defined. 
and we were talking about yesterday about how you know every time you go into a, a new production you have to kind of it's unique and you have to redefine that relationship which is again both a joy and a curse um, and but that brings people into the field that have so many different talents and so many different I guess everyone I think everyone loves to be in the room and but everyone also loves the different aspects like I personally I love being in the room, I love working with the playwright, but I also love working with the audience. Like that is kind of something that gets me going, but it's not something that is, is going to get a different dramaturgy, a different dramaturg going. And it's kind of making those priorities within, I've been harping on this, so I'm sorry for anyone who's been in my breakout sessions. <laughs> like as you make your priorities based off what is the mission of your theater, what is the, what is the goal of that production that you may be working on, what is your kind of focus that you want to do, like your responsibilities and what you're willing to do and what you're willing to let go will kind of come, kind of bubble up by itself. Because if I know that I want to do this, this, and this, and that's where I want to put my focus, then I'm just not going to be able to do this, this, and this. And as long as my institution is okay with that, as long as my playwright is okay with that, but is the form and the field, is that serving? I, I, I mean, I guess I, we, this group of people, more than any group of people we've had, keeps coming back to what works for you personally. And I don't mean to pick on you because you're not alone doing no, this at all. Fine. Um, and, and I find it really interesting that we keep coming back to what works for us personally in our daily work lives or in our, in our sense of how we're contributing to the world. And, and, but I'm not sure that that's relevant. How is that relevant? But isn't that what def in the best of circumstances, isn't that what defines an institution? I mean, like, the team is, the, t the team is not only a literary office of one, it's mostly an office of one. Um, but we're in the process right now of become, we're, we're, we're crossing the $500,000 mark. And so it's like, okay, what do we need? And so, and I realize that's pathetic because I'm asking, I'm using royal we when I'm asking what do I need. Um, but, it's, but it leads from what is my day-to-day -day existence in the organization and what do I, what do I, what am I happiest doing. Okay. So isn't, okay. I guess this goes back to the nimble thing, but it seems like a certain institutional dramaturg might be really fine at, and I, I don't mean, I mean like both enjoy and be strong at crafting a press release and crafting a crafting language about how the public is going to receive the play in a way that honors that work and they may enjoy doing that whereas another might not and so I wonder whether doesn't the personal have a place in defining the shape of and I, I trust that it yeah. does and I'm trying to get at what that place is yeah. I, it's not like I'm saying I think this is all wrong I just I can't find my way to what what is it underneath this uh, and it has something to do with being intact, being, ha bringing, uh, having joy and being uh, inspired day to day infects the form. And, and so that, and we're in an unhealthy... Well, th there's a certain amount of assumptions that are made that some people don't ever discuss. I, I assume that when a play is picked, you like it. But that might not be the case. It might be you want audience. I mean, I think there's some dishonesty that comes in. At, not dishonesty, but certain things. Or I assume that we have the same vision. I, what I find amazing is how little communication actually happens around why you wrote this play and why this theater picked it and why this director is involved and why that dramaturg is coming in. There's actually not that much conversation about it. Sometimes you all find yourself in a room and mm. you all think you like the play for the same reasons, and you you find out two weeks in a rehearsal you you don't, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what I find from playwrights again and again, and it just seems very simple because there's a lot of well-meaning people around, and I think the dramaturg is in a unique position to help question and bring these things out. But there's so many other demands being made at that point. But I, I sometimes just, I feel like, you know, oh, or, or you assume, you know, there's just a lot of assumptions that are not fit, investigated and talked about every time you start over. Mm -hmm. Because, the, and, and I think that's when things go astray a lot. And I, I, I realize sometimes I've, I've been with directors or scenic, that, and we never talked about why I wrote the play or why they wanted to be part of this. So we're back to the humanism yes. elements here as being needed to be embedded in this whole area, re-embedded, or at least preserved, part of the baby. Is, is the time to have these kind of humanist 
Humanist? I, I don't know Humanist? if that uh, baby has ever been so much in the picture. Maybe the baby should be born. <laughs> <laughs> There's no baby in this water. That's yeah, why I'm baby. struggling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone had the damn baby. I was going to bat. <laughs> My big dream would be that, you know, I, I always thought the dramaturgy at its most active and most energized could function as a sort of part of the brainstem of the theater's choices. Like many of us in the arts, our choices are sometimes driven limbically, is that where the reptile lives? I mean, strange attractions for material that have to do with the moment or the opportunity or the star or the, or the funding or whatever. And it seems to me dramaturgy, in dramaturgy resides uh, memory, artistic memory, cultural memory, why we are doing what we're doing. And I think any theater institution that honors that in how it implements dramaturgy within its halls is a theater that will only benefit by the overtones and the halftones and the resonance and the depth and the texture of what they do. I mean, there's no way to program those functions. Mm -hmm. You know, if everything is on the fly, yes. and theater will always be. Yes. But if you value theatrical intelligence, theatrical knowledge, if you value the past, value the future, and there's somebody who is smart enough to, and, and, and can talk well enough to reach people and keep that awake, I think theater only flourishes with that. And then you find out the particulars of how your days work later, but essentially the theaters need to value it, that within their midst. But I think you know? that is beautiful, and, and I am heartened, and I want to be that dramaturg. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I also feel, though, that there, you're also making the assumption that I am the one who loved your play and wanted to do it, and not just the one who was assigned to it. And that I keep going I'm not even to, talking about it, play production. I'm just talking about the institutions, how they plan their season, absolutely. how they talk about theater. And I'm in a magnificent yeah. place right now where that actually is very true. And that has not always been true. That has not mm -hmm. always been how my artistic director sees my position within that company um, or my position even within my literary office. Yeah. And so it's it's... It's a, it's a difficult question to untangle because, because it's a question for artistic directors as much as it's a question for us as to what, what you want from your office or your dramaturg. Or, you know, and I don't make a very distinct split between literary managers and dramaturgs most of the time. But when that artistic director is hiring us, you know, I, I used to have a joke that I felt like Dramaturg 37, but it didn't matter that it was Julie Dubner, that I was just Dramaturg 37. <laughs> you know? And now I'm in a position where I feel very much like it's Julie Dubner who is there. And that is not always true. And it's that true is, for, for you, though, now. Absolutely. So I, I sing the thing. song of OSF, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're right. I hear a lot of what makes me happy and this and that and the other thing. And they didn't hire me to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> they hired me to do the best I could for a play and the best I could for a playwright if I'm a dramaturg. That's my job. Mm -hmm. And hopefully I know how to do that. And hopefully I program my time so that I will succeed at it. I, 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 we're making it a hell of a lot more complicated than it seems like it is to me. If we, we have proper planning. If you don't, you're screwed. If, if four people get in a room, you know, for the first time, and four weeks later you've got a preview, then good luck. You know, I, I mean, this is something that should have been going on for eight to ten months previous. So uh, if, if that hasn't happened, then, then the institution's got a problem. They're doing it wrong. In which case, the dramaturg ought to address that bring that up. But, but essentially, your job is to do the best you can for a play and the playroom. That's your job. You know, once you get it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think that sounds good, Jerry. I just, I, maybe the issue is that those, those are not the functioning kind of, those are, I mean, I hear what you're saying, Amy, and, and, and what I take from what you're saying is you want to work in institutions where the art lives at the center and the people live and, and it's, it's like an ensemble that works around the you know the the making of the the you know the art is the heart of it and everybody is involved at the heart of it and in fact you know and again this is size based in terms of institutions but 
that's not actually how, I mean, come on, you know, we, we just worked on a project together, Karen and I just worked on a project together. It's not actually how institutions, I mean, it's a whole, it's a whole machine that you walk into, and that, at the heart of that machine is, is not necessarily art making. You know, there's a whole lot of other stuff at the heart of that machine that comes about as a result of, you know, and so I feel like, you know, what what's interesting about, I mean, yeah, it'd be great if we talked for 10 months, but I, I haven't been in an institution where anybody talks for uh, 10 months about a pro, I mean, there's like, maybe there's a workshop here, maybe there's a little bit of something there, but I, I just don't, I, I, I haven't I haven't seen that institution. I mean, it, sound, I mean, it seems like, you, Maybe you're living in it now, which is great. You know, maybe Manhattan Theater Club has that, but it, it, I don't think that's ubiquitous. I think people get, I mean, people kind of get jobbed in. They get jobbed in, they get assigned. Well, dramaturg number 37 and director number 38. And, you know, and then the dramaturg number 37 is running around trying to be also dramaturg number 33 and 34 on two other <laughs> projects. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and so I feel like that's the, that's what I hear to be the kind of soul crushing. That feels like the soul crushing part, you know, for that I hear from people is not feeling like they're a part of that, not even being able to focus in on that. Well, and, and I guess I, one thing to, to pull, uh, again, sorry, Jenny, for having you be the spur of that because it's not it's the farthest thing from you, but the, the sense of being <laughs> overwhelmed and off track, basically, it's, mm -hmm. it feels a little bit, I, and I get, I, I hear this everywhere I go, and I, uh, I feel it in places where I work. Uh, as a director, that the that there's something off in the the sense of uh, people being aligned to their uh, goals, their ideals themselves, like in in these institutions, that prevents a kind of uh, uh, productive or fertile uh, life for the art. In the, I mean, I'm, I'm going to struggle to get this out. But, but if people are not where they belong, if people are not where they, where they desire to be in the process and in the institutional chain, and if, the, if they're having to do work that they have to get through that's dues paying so that they can get to where they're going, as an artist, when I come into the relationship with the people who are disgruntled about where they are in the moment that I'm with them, it's not possible to have the best experience of the art. I feel like underpinning all of that is the fact that, I feel like, Paul, you were getting into it. Yeah, sorry. That at um, many of the institutional theaters in America, art is not at the center of the mission. And I feel like that's been, that's the elephant in the room in so many of these conversations. And that, like, I actually feel like in, in, a, in, a, in a functional working environment, people pursuing what gives them joy can be very, very productive. But if, it is set up so that that is actually like the only way to find a ray of light in a soul-crushing environment, and it's not going to work because it's going to be an additional mm -hmm. counterproductive yeah. thing. Yes, a counterproductive right. problem doesn't start with the individual pursuing the joy. It starts with the economics of the American theater, which is, and the fact that there's very, there's almost no institutions devoted entirely to encouraging the development of truly new work for the stage. What does it take? I want to go to another possible problem area. What does it take? I mean, the playwrights, Jerry, I mean, you guys have been in this for a, a, a long time. What does it take, let's go to playwrights, for you guys, for somebody to be able to uh, match you, to be your peer in the, in the room as a dramaturg? Or a, a, I mean, what, what sort of training, what sort of background? I'm asking because I think one of the things that we also experienced in this world, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the training programs right now are moving, Eric, you can speak to this. The training programs are moving people into the world with the expectation that they are now ready to sit in, in dialogue with the, with the script as it's coming and to give notes and to affect the test, to affect the production, right out of the, right out of the program. And is that true, that, that's, that, that you can get that from a, a program and come out ready to do that? Because it's certainly the way that people come into the organizations, assuming that they're ready. So what, what, what's your experience? I mean, in terms of where, where does this start to be problematic? It's related to what Jerry is talking about, that like you're not, you can't, I don't want to hear your notes about my work until we've sat down and spent some time together. And I actually think we should go out for coffee or beer and actually like get to know each other, and then we can talk about the work, and then we can talk about where it came from, 
and you can tell me what it makes you think of. You know, and then, and then over time you develop a relationship where actually I'm going to trust you to calm me on all of my bullshit. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that sitting in an office like two weeks before we go into rehearsal, whether you're at, straight out of your MFA or whether you've been working in the field for 20 years. The theater needs enough money to fly one of you out. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that that's been when it, it's come down to that type. Of, I mean, we're talking about the monetary. That's been sometimes in, in the room or something like that. But the, you, you need to find a way to meet people. And I mean, usually. But what do the people need to have in terms of the preparation? In terms of, I mean, you, you just listed a whole bunch of daunting things about the um, understanding of the past and, and uh, your respect and love for the past and uh, respect and, well, and vision for the future and. Uh, I mean, I, I'm assuming a lot of things that we're talking about is if their job qualifications are givens for people that find their way into theater. One is, you know, that you believe what you're doing is important, and there's a context in which you view it. So if, I, I mean, it's different for every play. I mean, I, um, not to embarrass him, but like Aaron was great to work yes. on uh, my play because he's a history buff, mm -hmm. and he knows history. I couldn't mm -hmm. have him And Aaron's right out of school. And he's right out of school. <laughs> okay. He's right. a baby, but he's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> you know? We had fabulous conversation because he's got a hungry mind, and he's well-read, and he's, you know, he's like a classical scholar, you know? He's the right guy, so it's not that. It's just, um, you know, the curiosity, the love of theater, and some, you know, knowledge of both what it has been, so you're not... So, so that you can solve the practical, because theater is so interestingly abstract and practical. So you need somebody who can dialogue in that way and who's been around enough to uh, see a train coming before you do, you know. And it, he likes your play. Yeah, I, I, tr I train playwrights. So it, 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 as to training dramaturgs, I, I don't. I find them. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think this is as common a model. I was saying this to Aaron Carter yesterday. I think that's a model that's, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like a less common model now that there is a lot more training for dramaturgs out there. But it used to be that, you know, this, this was the process, that you got training in playwriting and, and you wanted to be a playwright and, and it, it, for one reason or another, you were a person who was good at hearing other people's plays and responding to them and then, and then somehow you got a job as a dramaturg and that just kind of snowballed and there you were. Um, I think that, that is a fairly common thing to have happened in the past. I don't know that that's the case. Mm. And, but the way I find dramaturgs is, is the way we've been talking about it. And it comes from a place of, of joy, usually, at having been not the smartest person about the play, but having been the, pers the, the first audience member who got it. The first one who built the play in their own mind and said, I see what this is, I think I know what this is doing. Maybe I should ask, I think I know what this is doing. I'm gonna ask, is this what this is doing? It is, I got it. That kind of spark, that kind of moment is, is when I go, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm training playwrights, but I've got a couple here who have that spark with each other's work. And I know, okay, that particular individual is valuable to an MFA program because they're going to help the workshop table, but also they may also be valuable to the American theater in more than just what it is they put on a page as playwrights themselves. Can, can I ask you, can I ask a question about that? In the last session, um, uh, Alana tweeted out something about, um, she tweeted out something about that, uh, somebody I think said it, but she was just tweeting out that the playwright, that, you know, dramaturgy is like um, playwriting, it, it's a genius art form, and she, I don't think she was saying everybody was a genius, I think it was saying it's more of a DNA versus a trainable skill. And then a prominent um, artistic director of a large regional theater tweeted back, um, I love dramaturgy, but genius art, question uh, mark, um, uh, very few playwrights uh, uh, in history can be called genius, let alone dramaturgs. And so I just wonder about that, like, I mean, because I think that's kind of what you're asking, right? A little about yeah, well, what, what is it, take and what what's it take, what's the skill set? I mean, you could sort of say, we could locate that if we were talking about playwriting. We could, I mean, we, it would or be directing. Or directing, and so I just, that's the other where, that's the other place where, back to what I was saying earlier, this fear of being less integral comes from, we, do we really know what that is? You know, and my experience of artistic directors, you know, again, I love, but that would be very, what I would very much say I've experienced consistently. I love dramaturgy. 
a genius art form. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, so I think that's a, I, I feel like that's a thing that we contend with. I do, I also do feel like that there's a disconnect between uh, training in dramaturgy and work as a literary manager. Um, I mean, speaking to my own, like, I have an MFA in dramaturgy. I had like a, a summer internship where I, any, any knowledge of literary management I got came from a summer internship, but nothing that was taught to me in a classroom about how to be a literary manager. So I think that, and I wonder if when you speak to hearing people say, what I really want to do is be in the rehearsal room, but I have to do all this yeah. stuff, if there's something about, well, I trained to be in the rehearsal room, and now I have to do all this stuff. <laughs> um, so I, I wonder if there is some disconnect that comes from there as well. And, and I can't speak to you know, current MFAs in dramaturgy or dramaturgy experience, but that is sort of my experience. Um, yeah, and I, and I guess I have a concern about the value of all that stuff and the quality of, it, of the, ex, the um, exploration, um, execution of it, um, if the person is really trying to be over there. I don't think, and I don't think that's the case for everyone. And I feel no. like those of us who are, you know, I mean like, obviously I love a lot of that stuff and I want to do that stuff. Um, but I feel like that was something that we make for ourselves a lot of times instead of something that we were sort of trained to do. Um, and I feel like if programs want to train freelance dramaturgs who just are going to do dramaturgy, then they need to train them to be entrepreneurs and make their own businesses. Because <laughs> then they need to know how to do the business of doing that as opposed to they're like, you want to get a job, so you have to do all this. I do think there's a There's a bit of that. Well, but that's, it, go ahead. It's hard to quantify, too, that. Um, the, the more abstract aspects and the idiosyncratic aspects of dramaturgy, which is, you know, I think it's easier to um, point at the practical applications that a dramaturg, uh, or the contributions that a dramaturg makes to an institution, you know, the, the, the program notes and the press releases, and that's what we've now come to understand as dramaturgy, um, rather than something that's more you know, idiosyncratic or process-based or conversation-based or, you know, dynamic uh, relationship to the art and the artist. And so, and, and it's harder to quantify. It's, I think it's going the, back to the conversations about joy. I also feel like idiosyncrasy is part of it, too, and who you are as an individual and how you interface with the art and artist can, is of value, but, ha but it's different for each person who practices it because they're bringing a unique set of life experience to their work that's, that's, that's just embodied in them. But it's easier for an institution in particular to point at what is the practical applications of a dramaturg uh -huh. and say, that is dramaturgy. That's uh -huh. why, they, you know, I love dramaturgy because look at these great program notes and look right. at this great terms of phrases that have you know, come up. But the, but the more um, the abstract and the process stuff is harder to put value on even though it's incredibly valuable, it's harder to, to uh, put value on it. We're at time, and we could have talked about this for another hour, and we're not having a breakout on this particular topic, but let's let it infuse what we're talking about as we move into now. What are the things that need to move forward as the, the literary office of the future? <laughs> uh, and get it all the way into the rehearsal room if we can. All right? Well, can we... to, just to start off with what was laying here, what Polly said, just terrifies me. If, if people in the room here are being dramaturg 37, change that. that. You haven't got a chance to succeed if that's how you're doing business. So the, the best thing you can do for your institution or people who hire you is to let them know that. I can't do my job unless I have enough time to meet with the writer and it taken care of. Uh, if, if nothing else comes out of that, that, that would be a good thing, but that's a dramaturg 37. A manifesto. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, there, there are certain, uh, you know, when the play lab kind of stuff, you get stacked into that. When, when, when I was doing Sundance, you, you, mm -hmm. you, know, you would have a dramaturg working on four projects, and, you know, they're not going to love them all, but there was enough of a community there to sustain it, and you weren't producing a play. Mm -hmm. So it was it was a short-term thing, but if you are producing a 